Rosh has told us. So, we are learning the weekly Torah portion, Parshas Toldos. With the a story of, of Esav and Yaakov. What? A little bit of a late start. A little bit of a late start because of the Kinnus HaShulchim, which is still causing reverberations throughout the universe. Reverberations. <laughs> that too. And uh, Yaakov only just returned. <laughs> you tell us a story or two from the Kinnus that you heard? Before yeah, we start. There was some interesting stories, actually. Karen, I don't think I have to remember that. Okay. So, so, yeah, like, okay, so we're going to start oh, with yeah, the. There was, there was a good story. There, uh-huh. there was one good story. Uh, you know, there's a Chabad Shaliach in Beijing. What's his name? I've forgotten for a second. I know who he is. Yeah. What's his name? Something with an S. I can't remember. He's a British guy. Yeah. So, without his name, the story doesn't quite ring. But oh, yeah. no. So, what's so, his name? Uh, so, there's a new Shaliach came to Ganjun, you know, the yeah, other side another, of the world. Yeah. And uh, he's been there for a week or two, three weeks. Suddenly, the secret police knock on his door, and they arrest him and they arrest his wife, and they take them in for a hakira, him in one room and her in another room. Who are you? What are you doing? What are you, you doing walk? here? Yeah, why did you walk into that uh, McDonald's and, and ask I people, said, "Are you I, Jewish?" Have you heard this? Go on. You heard it? It's it's gone around the world three times already. Uh, Go okay. on. Yeah. So and I said, and, and who's this guy you keep talking about? And, so he says, uh, so he pulls out a picture of the Rebbe. You mean this? Yeah, he says, yeah, that's the one. He says, everybody's got pictures of him. Who is he? So he says, he's my father. <laughs> he says, your father? Okay, just a minute. And he picks up the phone, he dials with another, speaks in Chinese, and he looks up and says, that means you're Freundlich's brother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He says, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That, was a, that was a very funny, that was a funny off story. the cuff yeah. Yeah. I... I I, when I heard it, I heard that he was he was debating what to answer. Right. Like, who is this guy? Uh, he'll start telling him, oh, he's my teacher, he's my right. this, he's that. Said, well, oh, you're in a cult. Right. Okay, I see. So he's my father. Okay. Right. What is it? What is his name in Beijing? Freundlich, Freundlich. No, it's not Freundlich. It is. Okay. Shulich in Beijing is Freundlich. It's from Stamford Hill. Okay. We are told in Gemara Masechus Shabbos. That when Mashiach comes, we will refer only to Yitzchak as our father, right? Oh. And th- and this is a this is a really interesting Mara in and of itself, because the Gemara never the pasuk never says it. It's built. It's based on a pasuk. The pasuk says, "Ki atavinu," for you are our father. And the ata there is talking about Hashem, <laughs> speaking of who's your father. Right. It's not talking about Yitzchak, but the Gemara says that because the pasuk there, the verse starts with. Avram doesn't know us, and Yaakov doesn't recognize us. You are our father. So it says, well, if it's not Avram, and it's ya- not Yaakov, it's got to be Yitzchak. Well, right? Yitzchak's going to take the Kosher of Rocha, so. And then it goes through this whole explanation of why is it that in the future, when the Mashiach comes, only Isaac, only Yitzchak will know us. What, what does that even mean? So it says that uh, Hashem comes to Avram and says to him, uh, uh, your your children have sinned. So Avram says, well, they should be punished then. <laughs> a good father, right? Who did he learn that from? Hashem he learned them from Terach. Right? Afterwards, he comes to Yaakov, and Yaakov says the same thing, because the, gra- the grandson is always like the grandfather. They're always the same. So Hashem sees that this is not going to work. So he comes to Yitzchak. Yitzchak so as much as Yitzchak was with only one child, Avram had many children. He had, altogether, he had eight children, or even nine, nine children. Um, Yitzchak didn't have any children. He had, one, he had two children. They, they caused him trouble, but he had the fewest, fewest children of all the patriarchs. And in spite of that, he, he has compassion. You could have guessed that it was him because, because he had Asaph. Now, Avram had some compassion on Ishmael, but in the end, he sent him away. But Yitzchak never, you know, both he and Rivka, they never thought of sending Esav away. They never had such a thought. He's their son. Wh- whatever he is, yeah, okay, he's serving time in uh, Chino now, right? He's, uh, he's in prison, he's this, he's that. He's still their son. He, they, they still take care of him. So Avraham uh, won't won't help, and Yaakov won't help. So he goes to Isaac, and he says to Isaac, your children have sinned. So right away, Isaac says, my children? They're not your, your children, God? 
your children, your, your children. You said, Banim atem la'ashem elokechem. You said, we're the children of Hashem. So he says, okay, okay, let's see, let's see, what did they sin? How much did they sin? So God wants to give off a whole list. Uh, Yitzchak is very practical. He says, how much can a person sin during their lives? Let's, let's do the cheshbon. So first of all, he sleeps eight hours out of the day. So that's a third, a third off. <laughs> let's go on. <laughs> he has to eat, he has to drink. He has to go to the bathroom, he has to do this, he has to do that. You're, you're left with another eight hours. Then he says, it can't be that he sins the whole eight hours. He also takes care of his parnasa. He also has to go to work, do this. In the end, they're left with like three hours in which a person could sin. So then Yitzhak says, look, I'll take half, you take half, we'll finish the whole thing. And that's how it all ends. So Chassidus explains that this is because Yitzhak personified the idea of bittel, self-nullification, and embodied Bitzel some... is gevorah? Yeah, he's Gvura, and he's also Bittel. It's very What's interesting. The Bittel and Gvura. Now, Gvura in general is what we call um, being stringent, being uh, or yes. breaking things up into pieces. But Bittel is something entirely different. Where did where did Yitzchak exhibit Bittel more than anyone else? When he was at the Akeda, right? To be able to s- s- to lie there on the altar, or makeshift altar that Abraham had made, and to be willing to be sacrificed in God's name, that requires a tremendous amount of self-nullification. It's not a normal act that most people can do. So he embodied, he embodied this self-nullification and he had fear of heaven. His particular character traits will be emphasized and widespread when Mashiach comes. So says the Rebbe, so Chassidus explains this, that why is Yitzchak going to be our father? Because those two traits, self-nullification and fear of heaven, will be widespread in the world when Mashiach comes. What does that mean? The people will have a sense that they have to dedicate their lives to something that's higher than just their material needs. That's a sense of self-nullification. Self-nullification doesn't mean I don't exist. It means that myself is not the primary interest. That I'm not primarily interested in what I want or what I don't want. I'm trying to serve a higher purpose. That is self-nullification. That, that's what he calls self-sacrifice. Like a person goes to the army, he says, I, my, my needs come second, and the needs of the many come first. So that's also it's a form of self-nullification. And fear of heaven means that it will be palpable. People will feel godliness in the world. They'll feel it. Right? We, we talked about this many times when we were certain uh, maimarim that we learned in the Kutei Torah. That people will come and search for places to hide because of the fear that will grab them. And again, the fear there is not necessarily that the person is afraid that you know, a comet is going to fall down on, on them from the sky. It just means that you have a tremendous sense of God's presence. And, and in God's presence, like in the presence of anyone great, but all the more so when it's God who's present, people have a sense of awe, they have a sense of, of well, they freeze in a certain sense, it's very hard for them to function, so, so you look for a private place where, where somehow you can have that privacy so that you can function normally, so that's what people will look for. Therefore we will refer specifically to him as our father, because of these two traits. It is possible that this is the reason why the life of Yitzchak resembled the times of Mashiach in other areas as well. Although it says that all the forefathers, all the patriarchs, were given a taste of the world to come in their own lifetime, regarding Avram and Yaakov, it was merely a glimpse or a glimmer conveyed at times throughout their normal physical lives. It, it, it showed up from time to time. They had a taste of it here and a taste of it there. But by Yitzchak, his entire life was lived within the reality of Olam Haba. It's like Yitzchak never came down from that mountain. Right? It says that only Avram came down. What does it mean? It means that uh, <laughs> Yitzchak had to come down from, from the mountain, Mount Moria, where he was uh, put on the altar. No, so the Torah doesn't, it says only Avram came down. So Yitzchak, even if he came back to reality, he was forever on that mountain. He, he, so he, people could look at it, you know, this is a, with, with, um, with, um, trauma, there's usually an attempt to get rid of it. Well, if 
you would have been put up on a, on a, on a mountain and on an altar, and your father takes a, a knife to, to sacrifice you. That's a good contender for deep trauma, right? But for Yitzchak, Yitzchak understood that that was a gift. <coughs> it wasn't something that he needed to extract from his system. It probably had some effect, but he understood that the right way to do it, or to treat it, is to integrate it into himself in a positive way. It's basically what people do uh, as a, an Israeli psychiatrist who started the, uh, the uh, treatment of trauma through chasifa. Um, they say chasifa. I forget the word. Edna Foa is her, is her name, and uh, I have all her books here, but um, I forget what it's called in English. It's by exposure, mm -hmm. by, by slowly increasing the exposure to the trauma, meaning reliving it, mm -hmm. that actually reliving it is the, is the right way to get over it. Transferring it from the left brain to the right brain. Something like that, so or what Freud would say, that when the trauma hit, you weren't expecting it. So it hit you pretty hard. And that's why uh, you shudder from it. But if you can reenact it and re-expose yourself to it when you're in control, Doesn't so then you can assimilate it. Right? So why assimilate it? There's an understanding that, well, you could say it's just because I don't have any other choice. But in, but in Yitzhak's case, it's because those moments when he was on the altar ready to be sacrificed, were moments in which he tasted from the world to come. But because that was something that was his already, he had already experienced it, and he, he could bring it up every, every time, whenever he wanted to even. Sometimes I probably hit him without him expecting it, but, but he also had the ability to expose himself to it um, whenever he chose to. So he felt olam haba, he felt the world to come all the time. This is because yeah. during the... So here he says. So, so how, how does this describe in the Zohar? The Zohar says, this is because during the Akedah, when he was bound on the altar, Yitzchak's neshama left his body and was re replaced by another neshama from the world to come, after which he lived the rest of his life in an other world state. So the Zohar, Zohar is saying very deeply that in the trauma, it could be that what you're experiencing is a change in the soul that makes you function. On another level of the soul, or a different soul. Right. We'll finish it tomorrow, 7.30. 7 7.30 tomorrow morning. Rosh Hashanah. Don't forget to say the other day. Very good. Thank you for being so patient. I came a long way. I think you came like 7,000 miles. <laughs> tomorrow. Tomorrow on the plane, when we flew out. Lady. You had stewards on the plane? The stewardesses, three Jewish stewardesses, and I spoke to one of them for about an hour and a half. Very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. So, everybody should remember that uh, we're going to hear a story tomorrow. <laughs>